right. Looks like we have our, our mic back. How'd the exam go? Uh, so, okay. We'll see. Uh, we should get it back on Friday. I don't know if I'll be able to get it back on Wednesday or not, but definitely by Friday we'll, we'll get it back. Uh, lab practicals today, same times. So if you came at two o'clock, come at two o'clock again. If you, if you came at three o'clock, come at three o'clock again. Uh, again, it'll be 50 minutes. Uh, we actually have fewer questions, so it's instead of being out of 60 points, it's out of 56 points because uh, we didn't have any canthocephalins, and man, it, it was a struggle to, to kind of fill out some of the questions. And I just said, heck with it, I, I can't come up, can't make any more any more questions. But it'll be 56, and we do have four extra credit questions on there, so. Hopefully, you're prepared for it. All right. Any questions? All right. Phylum acanthocephala. Do you have these handouts? Printing them out. So let's start. So these are the thorny-headed worms. Uh, I do know you get you cover these in the zoology course. So. Yeah, yeah. If you've had zoology, I think everyone here has had zoology, you've seen them at least once. That's good. There it is. All right, so why are they named the thorny headed worms? It's because of their proboscis. They have a proboscis that has hooks on them, that's at the anterior end. So, as people were describing these, they said, hey, this is going to be the thorny headed worms. They have a cosmopolitan distribution. We'll find them all throughout the globe. Uh, there's only about 1,100 described species. Uh, about 1,100 described species. So it's not super speciose, uh, but all of them are endoparasites. Now, for these acanthocephalins, uh, you're going to find aquatic life cycles. You're going to find terrestrial life cycles. You're going to find acanthocephalins that infect vertebrates and invertebrates. So it is... Uh, a diverse group in terms of their life cycles, um, you know, who they use, and where they occur. All of our members are dioecious, so that's very similar to our nematodes. All of them will exhibit sexual dimorphism, some of them more pronounced than others. So even with our nematodes, we can be dimorphic. Some species are more dimorphic than others, and same, same case here with the acanthocephalus. Phylogenetically, we're a little unclear on the relationship to other organisms. So I think in zoology, I haven't been in zoology for years, uh, but it was always taught as its own phylum, and we're teaching it as its own phylum here. But that might not be 100% correct. There's quite a bit of evidence that's actually suggesting that canthocephalins are nested within the rotifera, the phylum rotifera, so which would make them a rotifer, basically. Uh, not a classic rotifer, but like a highly modified rotifer. So a rotifer that's been modified to the parasitic lifestyle. Um, so if we look at systematics, you've got your syndromata uh, and then sisonida. Here's all your rotifers. Puts the canthocephalins right nested smack dab in the middle. A lot of the rotifers that you would have looked at in your uh, zoology class are going to be these. Bloidia. That's at least from what I remember. Uh, could be different though. So there's, you know, uh, that sequence analysis that really kind of puts them in there. Uh, so we're going to keep it as a phylum though. So they're likely highly modified rotifers, but we're going to keep them as their own phylum. Ready? All right, general morphology. 
variable in size. You've got some that are pretty small, some that are fairly large, uh, including some that are greater than a, than a meter. Those are some pretty big acanthocephalans. And don't think these are like giant, you know, alien type creatures that you see in the movies. These are going to be fairly thin, but they're going to be a meter long. Uh, most of them are going to be less than two centimeters. So the, the specimen, specimens that we find, you know, locally, uh, if you go out to other places in Texas, they're going to be fairly small. See them with with the you know naked eye, you can pick them up and move them around, but uh, they're not going to be monsters. They're not going to be tiny. When we look at these guys, we can break their body down into three generalized regions: the proboscis, the neck. got three general regions. We've got our proboscis. Top the neck is the smooth part of that proboscis, and the trunk is the body proper. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about each of these individually. All right, so three generalized regions. We also then have two terms that kind of group them together. So the internal body plan seems to follow two general regions. The presoma and the metasoma. So the presoma would be the proboscis, neck, and all of the other attached muscles and organs. So we'll learn about this hydraulic system that they have in there. So they're separate. You've got a system that's for the presoma that works at, at protruding the proboscis and retracting the proboscis. That's our presoma. And then you have the trunk, which has everything else. It has all the reproductive structures and so forth. So the trunk would be the metasoma. So we're going to go and talk about each of these regions. Ready? All right, so the proboscis. This is the primary attachment organ. It is unique to this group. That's why they're called that. They can't suffer. So it's a primary attachment organ. It's temporary attachment. So our worm can attach to the intestinal epithelium. And then they can detach. This proboscis is variable in shape. So we're, when we talk about variable uh, in shape, we're talking about the length. Some of them are long, some of them are small. We're talking about the number of hooks. Do you have a lot of hooks? Do you have a few hooks? We can talk about the shape of hooks, the pattern, the arrangement of the hooks, and so forth. So there's just a lot of vari variation. And this variation has actually been used to identify the various species. If they're, it, the utility in identification is very high. This proboscis can be retracted. When it gets retracted, it gets retracted into the proboscis receptacle. This proboscis receptacle is a muscular blind sac into which a proboscis can be retracted. Right, so I think that's almost self-explanatory. All right, this proboscis is going to bear its own uh, lacunar system, or lacunar system. Uh, and I briefly define it here. It's, it's a fluid-filled canal system. This is our hydraulic system, hydraulic and trans transport system in our worm. Uh, we're going to talk more about this later on in the presentation, as, as you'll see. So uh, I just define it here so that you know, have an idea of what it is. So it has its own hydraulic system. This, uh, Lacunar system uh, probably aids in movement, definitely aids in, in uh, eversion of that proboscis. And this receptacle, this proboscis receptacle, is also where the cerebral ganglia is located. So you could say the brain, the nerve center. So if the lacunar system is used to evert the proboscis, how does the proboscis get retracted back in uh, to that? Receptacle, it's, you have inverter muscles. So you've got muscles that, that tend to cross, and when they contract, they pull the proboscis in. The fluid has to go someplace. It goes into uh, some sacs that, that we'll see in a bit. So there's a lot of variation in our, in our proboscis. <laughs> Ready? 
All right, so the neck is a smooth region of the proboscis. So you can say the proboscis is like the armed portion. The neck is going to be the smooth portion. And the SEM images really kind of shows that part, the smooth part. Uh, that This would be our neck. If we go back to uh, the previous slide, we can see areas that are smooth. This would be our neck. Here's our neck. Uh, this guy, there's our neck right up there. But it's a smooth part. Uh, the neck retractor muscles uh, aid in pulling back the proboscis. So neck retractor muscles, and then we have the proboscis inverter muscles. Um, those both are working together. Uh, this area could have lateral sense organs, probably to help the acanthocephalin know where they're at, where they're at in the host. This is from, uh, this SEM is from Manila Formis, Manila Formis. Have we encountered that before? In lab, it's one of our presentations. So this was uh, from the rat. Pretty cool, pretty cool SEM image. All right, the trunk is where everything else is gonna take place, so all of our reproduction. Uh, the trunk is a fluid-filled body cavity you're gonna find the reproductive organs here, and this area ha also has a lacunar system, or lacunar system. And I'm gonna say lacunar system, that's what seems natural to me. All right, and then you also have muscles and stuff in there. Uh, the reproductive organs, and we'll talk about male and female reproductive structures and, and so forth, but interesting thing about the acanthocephalin is that these reproductive organs develop in a structure called ligament sacs. So they are in ligament sacs. These ligament sacs are structures that extend from the proboscis uh, receptacle to the genital pore. It's going to envelope the gonads and any of the other accessory organs. Um, this, the appearance of this sac or the visibility of the sac, uh, or I guess you should say, the sac itself could disintegrate and disappear as we become more and more mature, or as the worm becomes more and more mature. But they always start, all the reproductive organs start in the sac. So if we go to this, this diagram, this is uh, a male, right? You've got a ligament sac that basically encloses all of it. So here's our proboscis receptacle. It attaches up here, and it goes all the way down to the genital pore. And here we actually have the bursa that's inverted, but you've got a pouch that'll hold the bursa as well. So all of that is enclosed inside these ligament sacs, which is, again, you, we haven't seen anything like this yet. So that's where the reproductive organs are in the trunk, and then the trunk also has its own uh, lacunar system, and that's our metasoma. It's a, it's a part, it's, it's separate from the presoma lacunar system. Body could have spines, embedded in the tegument, just like some of our other worms. Right? It could have a spiny tegument. doesn't have to, but it could. Uh, and notice we haven't seen a mouth at all. So all nutrients have to be absorbed across the tegument. Right? It's going to have to absorb all of its nutrients. And we get to think about the absorption and the problems and the solutions with our worms. Ready? All right, so the body wall and the tegument. It's a complex syncytium. We've seen a syncytial tegument before. What's a syncytial tegument? What is a syncytial tegument? Yeah, so did you say it? Yeah, okay, so yeah. The outer surface is anucleate, nuclei located in cytons. So the entire tegument is multinucleated because we don't have the divisions between our cells. Uh, we don't have our divisions between the cells, and that's what it is. 
So in our diagram here, we're actually looking at the outside is down below, and then we move towards the interior as we, as we go up in this figure. So this complex incision is going to be arranged in three different layers. We have our outer tegument, our outer tegument, our muscle layer, and then our longitudinal muscles. Or, I'm sorry, our outer tegument, and then your longitudinal and your circular muscles. Outer tegument, circular, longitudinal muscles, and we've got them. We've got a map. So we're going to talk about each of these. The outer tegument is divided into four different zones. The bottom is the basement membrane, so basically the end of our epithelium. Just like if you, think, if you take anatomy, the basement membrane sets off the, the epithelium. So at the very top of the epidermis. So the outer tegument has a surface coat. That is at the top. So now we've kind of reversed the order. Now we're going from the top towards the inside. Surface coat is also called the brush border. Brush border has been used uh, or could be used for our platyhelminthes as well. It's just that very outer surface layer, surface coat. This uh, brush border is a plasma membrane covered by carbohydrate-rich lipocalyx. Should fix that plasma membrane. That membrane, plasma membrane covered by a, a carbohydrate-rich glycocalyx. There's going to be numerous infoldings and pores. It's all aimed at increasing our surface area. Those pores lead to crypts. Those crypts are going to be found in the next zone, which is called the striped zone. All right, and we'll talk about the striped zones and, and stuff. The function of this surface coat or the brush border. Nutrient absorption, number one. That's why we have a bunch of infoldings and pores, try to maximize the surface area. But also inactivation of enzymes. This is inactivation of host enzymes aimed at trying to break down this worm. So they're gonna try to you know, block it, uh, do what they can to uh, avoid getting killed by the host. So our surface coat, pretty small, pretty thin layer. The next layer is our striped zone. Ready for that? All right, so the striped zone. So we said we've had these pores, and they leave down into the crypts, right? A crypt is just basically this, this big compartment, all right? It's going to probably be like a dead-end type of narrow compartment. Think of a, you know, you know what a keyhole looks like on a street? Just imagine that you have a bunch of these keyholes where they open up at the surface of the brush border and the keyholes down in the stripe zone. It's all of those. It's all of those crypts that give the stripe zone the appearance of being striped. That's why they're named. All right. The pores themselves and that channel that leaves, leads to the bottom of the crypt will limit the size of the molecules that could reach the base. So now it's like a size selection type of system because its function is penocytosis. So you can say cell cellular drinking. We're letting in some of the smaller, smaller compounds, small, smaller molecules. This is where they get absorbed. The bigger stuff gets absorbed on the brush board. So our stripe zones are named for the crypts. We do have the SEM images. So our SEMs, here's these crypts, the bottom of the crypts. Uh, now remember, it's a cross section. So you, you might not hit a, a channel or a canal. So here's one crypt. This could be part of that channel that leads down there, or that could be a channel leading to another crypt. Same thing here. But you get the striped appearance because you have all of these channels leading down towards the crypt. That's our stripe zone. Ready? The next zone gives the tegument its, its uh, straight, a lot of its strength. It's called the felt fiber zone. All right, 
Why is it called the felt fiber zone? Because you're going to have numerous closely packed, uh, closely packed, randomly arranged fibrils. So if you've ever look in, looked closely at felt fabric, you would notice that the felt itself is made up of small fabric particles that are randomly arranged all throughout and, and, and interweaved. All right? That's why felt is like so tough that there's locked in place because it's all random. It's thought that that's the same type of deal. You've got all these fibers, randomly arranged fibrils, it's going to convert strength. But that's not the only thing because we also have a bunch of metabol metabolically active organelles in this region. So mitochondria, Golgi, etc. Stuff that's going to be... Uh, producing compounds for secretion, stuff that's going to be uh, breaking down compounds that, that's been absorbed, uh, and so forth. So things that are absorbed from the surface coat or absorbed in uh, those crypts and felt fiber can go here for breaking down and processing to go to the rest of the worm. If we're going to be secreting some compounds, a lot of this stuff gets packaged at this point and then transported to the brush board. Or surface coat. So felt fiber zone. And then our radial fiber zone. Radial fiber zone's the biggest zone. Has about 80% of the thickness of that tegument. You're gonna have large bundles of radially arranged filaments. So radially a range would be more along, like circular, you could say, circular. You're going to find the nuclei in this place. So for like a syncytial tegument, nuclei are in cytons. You can think of it as being, this is where the cytons reside. But it's not entirely... 100% true because with our acanthocephalin, our nuclei can have multiple nucleoli. And it can lead to this appearance of, of giant nuclei in the body wall. And we do have some of those slides. I, I'm, I'm sure some of you have looked at slides where you've seen some stuff or identified the giant nuclei in the tegument. So don't think we've got a bunch of these cytons scattered around. Sometimes they are all combined into a single large nuclei with many nucleoli. This zone also contains the lacunar system. This is our hydraulic canal system. So here's our 80%. You've got your uh, radially arranged fibers, and then you've got your lacunar canals that are moving through the surface. What do you think those are for? canals. Anything? Any guess? Okay, so kind of like a hydraulic system. All right, so that's one. What's the second one? So we talked about these guys. Let's contrast them with the platyhelminthes. What does their body look like? Which ones? The platyhelminthes are flat, right? What are these guys? They're round, so this is, this is round. I didn't say anything about being flattened. So why are the platyhelminthes flat? Greater surface area and? And? Do they have a circulatory system? How do you get nutrients transported? Yeah. Osmosis and diffusion. So if you're flat, it's going to be easier to get to the middle. 
These guys aren't fly. How are they going to transport their nutrients? Uh, yeah, that lacunar system is thought to be able to transport nutrients and waste. Still relying on, on I mean, you still don't really have a circulatory system. Uh, so you're still relying on diffusion, but this is going to provide a means of which we can transport things uh, a little bit easier through the body. So we'll talk about that right now. So the lacunar system is integrated with the musculature. All right. We already said, gave a definition. It's a system of fluid-filled channels in the body cavity and the proboscis. The body cavity and the, and the proboscis, the metasoma and presoma are different. They're separate ones. So we've got one system in the presoma, second system in the metasoma. And they do appear to be separate systems, that they do not connect in any way. All right, we have them here. You've got your uh, hypodermal canals. So this is probably the best. So your reading network, and reuse terms, network of, of the uh, lacunar system, where you've got your canals, radial canals, and then you have branch points that kind of dig deeper into the surface. So it's providing a way where you can diffuse, get absorbed, diffuse to the lacunar system, and then once it hits our transport system, it can move through the body. All right. So this is embedded in the muscles, and it's because the muscles are one of our primary metabolic consumers, our primary energy consumers. It uses energy to, uh, to contract right, and move. So they're going to produce a lot of waste. Um, because they are metabolically active, we also have nutrients. So with the lacunar system being integrated into the muscles, it can help carry waste and nutrients to and away. So nutrients to the muscles, waste away from those muscles. Second thing is that it's acting like a hydrostatic skeleton. It's under pressure. So when the muscles contract, it's actually going to have something against which the mu muscles can actually work. Right? If you just have a muscle there and it just flexes, it's not going to do any work unless it's attached to something that's going to provide resistance. So our lacunar system is rather unique to, our, to this group. Rather unique. It is unique to this group. Ready? All right. Whoops. So the musculatures. Uh, still part of our tegument. So we've got a longitudinal layer surrounded by a circular layer. So that means we can stretch, stretch and contract. And then radially, we can kind of constrict. And then I guess fatten up, you could say. In. That's our circular layers. Uh, the muscular fibers are a little bit different. They are hollow, and that allows them to be continuous with the lacunar system. And muscle fibers are hollow. They're continuous with the lacunar system. Uh, the circular muscles uh, will push the fluid into the longitudinal muscles. So part of our, you know, we don't have heart pumping it pumping the fluid, so we rely on muscle contractions. Much the same way that our body kind of relies on uh, muscle contractions to uh, move some of our lymphatic fluid. Circular fluids push fluid into the long longitudinal muscle channels. Longitudinal muscles, when they contract, they'll push fluid into the circulatory muscles and so forth. So, kind of a mutual benefit for why these lacunar systems are embedded in the muscles. Easy way to transport nutrients and wastes to and from the muscles, and then also muscle contractions help to move the fluid. Ready? Reproductive systems. So, our, as we said, our reproductive systems will develop inside of a ligament sac. Depending on the species, you could have one or two ligament sacs that will attach to that posterior end of the proboscis receptacle and then extends to near the distal genital pore. So our genital pore will be located near the posterior end of that worm. 
The ligament sac is an envelope surrounding the gonads and accessory organs and so forth. It's in the acanthus cephala. This is where we find it. May degenerate as the worm matures, or it may be permanent. We could see it. I honestly don't think we could see any of the ligament sacs in our specimens that we have. But we presented, you know, these worms, so you can kind of see where the general ligament is, you know, and it would encapsulate, you know, the testes and then cement glands and accessory organs in this worm. Uh, but when you look at this worm, we can make out the genital ligament. So that's where our ligament sacs, but you don't see anything up here in the rest of the body wall. So they could degenerate. They may be permanent, just kind of species specific. So all of our gonads are going to develop in this these ligament sacs. And we've got male and female worms. So we're going to start with the male system. So the male system starts with two testes. You have a vas efferens from both of them. When the vas efferens join up, it now becomes vas deferens, and then the vas deferens leads to the, the penis of the worm. So we had cirrus, right? And then we had spicule. Now we've got just a penis, is what they said. But the male has accessory structures. And we're going to go through and talk about these various accessory structures. So the first ones we have are cement glands. So we have a couple acanthocephalins that are stained. Right? We do have a male. So when you look at these, know that we're, you're going to see two testes. Those are going to stain. All right? And they're going to be the most anterior. And then next to that will be our cement glands. The cement glands, their function is to secrete copulatory cement. That copulatory cement is actually a tanned protein. So it's a protein that's going to harden up, kind of like cement, right? And hence its name, cement glands. Its function is to cap the vagina after the male copulates with her. So the male is going to copulate, it's going to deposit sperm, and then the cement glands will secrete the protein and try to form a copulatory cap. Why does he do that? Why does he do that? Exactly. What, it, the, what this worm is trying to do is they've deposited their sperm. They want those sperm to fertilize the ova fertilize the eggs that are in there. And by putting on that copulatory cap, it's giving them a head start, basically. This cap, this plug, will break down and, and get released. Maybe a week or so. Um, we'd have to really check. I don't know, if, you know how many papers have actually looked at how long does this persist. But it will break down. So it's giving this male an edge. Giving this male an edge. Incidentally, sometimes these worms are stupid and they can't identify a female, so they try to copulate with the male. And we know that because you will find patches of this, of this cement on a male worm. It's not like they have a big brain. Three little tangles, just right up there. Hi. Hi. All right, so the second accessory structure that we can talk about is the copulatory bursa. All right, so the copulatory bursa is a bell-shaped specialization of our distal body wall that has invagination of the posterior and body cavity, except during insemination. So our bursa is just like any other copulatory bursa that we've seen, right? Hookworms have it. We, we have slides of the bursa for hookworms. Its function is to grasp and hold that female during copulation, all right? But unlike the hookworms, this bursa, the acanthocephalins, is normally retracted. It would, normally, it would only evert and come out when it's getting ready to, to, to copulate with that female. All right? 
So the copulatory bursa can get retracted into a, a pouch. That pouch um, isn't statogen's pouch. Seems like it would be. Uh, Safetogen's pouch is what holds the fluid, the hydraulic fluid, that when contracts will then force the bursa to revert. All right, so uh, we do have some. I don't know if any of our slides have the bursa actually sticking out. I think one that I looked at last week, the bursa was completely retracted. Normally, when you prep these worms, you get the worm, you put the, you put the, uh, uh, they're best when you collect them live, because you have to put them in water, put them in the fridge. The osmotic difference will cause them to avert their bursa, and then you have to try to get them fixed pretty quickly at that point and hope that the bursa remains out. That's our goal. Um, when, you, when you pick up roadkill animals, vast majority of these things, the bursa is retracted, which can hinder some of the identification. So the safetogen, so the copulatory bursa can be retracted. The inversion of this is safetogen's pouch. So it's a muscular sac, uh, sac attached to the base of the bursa. When it squeezes, it pushes that fluid into the bursa, allowing it to go out. When the bursa gets retracted again via muscles, that fluid is going to go into the safetogen's pouch. So that is our male worm. Any questions? Female system is going to be a little bit different. All right, a little bit different than what, what we've been used to. So we have our ligament sac. That's going to be attached up near the top. And then inside of our light ligament sac uh, is, is where the ova eggs will be. All right. Now, you can note on my general pattern, we don't have them listed. Because what happens is the ligament sac extends down, connects to the uterine bell, then the uterus, then the vagina, and the gonopore. All right, so the gonopore would be your opening. All right. So what is in the ligament sac? Well, inside the ligament sac, we don't have ovaries. Instead, what we have are things called ovarian balls. These ovarian balls are clusters of oocytes, clusters of ova, basically, that's derived from fragmentation of the ovary. So in our platyhelminthes, the ovary is compact, right? That, that, that includes our, flat, our, our uh, trematodes and our cestodes. In our nematodes, our ovary is solid, but it's, it's tubular, right? It's tubular, but it's solid. Here, our ovary has been fragmented into these clusters of oocytes called the ovarian balls, all right? The fragmentation usually occurs early during maturation, so that's why you don't really ever see this, this concentrated ovary, all right? And these balls will be floating freely inside of the ligament sac. inside the ligament sacs. When they start to get fertilized, they will break up and each oocyte could become an egg. And then it's going to mature the egg and while these eggs are floating freely, they're going to encounter our selection apparatus, which is called the uterine bell. So the uterine bell is this muscular, funnel-shaped organ that allows mature, fertilized eggs to pass through into the uterus, uh, and the vagina, and it keeps all of the immature eggs and unfertilized eggs in that ligament sac. So it's trying to separate those eggs that are fertilized and ready to get released from all of those eggs that are unfertilized and not ready to be released. All right, so you've got like this funnel, if you can imagine, you've got this funnel-shaped system that has like a sieve on the side. As our smaller immature eggs come through, they're going to hit the sides. They're going to slip through the slits of that funnel back into the ligament sacs. The larger eggs hit the sides of that funnel. They can't fit through the sieve, so they keep flowing down to the bottom of that funnel, which leads into our uterus. 
So all of this is suggesting that it is size-based selection, which seems to be the case. It's size-based selection. Mature eggs or larger eggs, they're not going to get returned to the ligament sac. They're just going to pass right down into the uterus. This is unique to the acanthocephala, which is a defining feature of our acanthocephala. I think the textbook has another diagram of it. So uh, we kind of had it based on a whole worm because oftentimes a diagram, it's, 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 you don't necessarily see that. But uh, in the books in the lab, you can kind of check it out or you can do some searches if you want to look more at it. Look, look into it more. Ready? All right, generalized life cycle. So our hosts, uh, often a vertebrate definitive host, invertebrate intermediate host, and peritonic hosts are common. Oftentimes, a peritonic host would be a, another vertebrate host. Uh, but it, again, not necessarily. All right, so those are our hosts. The generalized life cycle starts with an egg the egg hatches, releasing the acanthor. The acanthor will develop into an acanthella. Acanthella develops into a cystocanth, and then the cystocanth develops into the adult. And this doesn't necessarily mean we have four hosts or three hosts. You could have acanthor that just kind of progressively develops right to the cystocanth in, what, in that first intermediate host. But we're presenting eight of these because these are the life cycle stages. And they're different. Each one is different. They have, that's why they have their own name. So we're going to start with the acanthor. The acanthor is that larval stage right after the, the egg. What sets it apart from our myrcidia and coracidia and oncomyrcidia and oncospheres and so forth is the presence of an acolyt organ. So the acolyt organ is hooks and spines at the anterior end and their associated muscles. So we have hooks and spines, we've got retractor muscles that they can use to, to pull and cause their spines to flip up and everything. They use these guys, these spines and stuff in the muscles for penetration inside of our host. This acolyt organ is also called a rostellum. But notice, they're not ciliated, right? So, myrcidia are ciliated, coracidia are ciliated. Your uh, oncomyrcidium, ciliary tufts, right? So, no, no, no cilia. Um, our onchosphere has how many hooks? It's an oncosphere. What, what group has an oncosphere? Good review for the final. Cestodes, right? How many hooks do they have? How many? What's another name for oncosphere? Maybe that'll help you with the hooks. Hexacanth larva. Six. So yeah, three pair three pairs. You're you're right. You had two. There's three pairs of those. So they're in pairs. These, you've got hooks and spines. Hooks and spines and muscles. And you don't I mean you've got spines on those. Uh, but again, it's it's you don't have three pairs of those. So the acanth. Larval stage with this acolyt organ. It's also called a rostellum. Uh, it's a larval stage after our egg. Um, the acanthella, I believe I have next. Yep. So the acanthella is a developing stage. So in our acanthella, our organ systems are developing from a central nuclear mass and hypodermal nuclei of our acanthor. So 
at this stage, we have lost that acolyt organ. Right, we've lost those hooks and spines. And we are differentiating at this point. Sometimes you'll see these giant nuclei present in the tegument. But we are starting to develop the organ system. So we're starting to develop, uh, start to see some of the ligament sacs starting to appear, the proboscis starting to appear, the proboscis inverter muscles, the receptacles, right? You're getting all of this developing. And this is normally the stage that if you only have two hosts, this is the stage that you kind of develop through to get to that cystocanth, which would be that final larval stage inside of that intermediate host. And that cystocanth is basically a fully developed acanthella that is now infected to our definitive host. Right, so we're using acanthella as a developing stage. And then once we get to the final fully developed acanthella, we are now at the cystocanth. And usually at our cystocanth, we have the fully formed proboscis with the hooks, the number, the arrangement of hooks and everything, which... It's good for us because oftentimes it's the proboscis that gives us an idea or allows us to get down to maybe the genus level, possibly even the species level, just from our larval stage. We don't usually have any sort of reproductive structures fully developed. Again, it doesn't have to be. Some of them we, we can actually see uh, development of testes. You know, So you look at it and say, okay, yeah, this is, this is a male. Some cases you'll have the ovarian balls that are in the ligament sac. Uh, you'll have, you know, basically know where the uterine uh, bell is and, and so forth. These cystocanths are often insisted inside the host. All right, they're insisted inside a hyaline structure. What does that mean, a hyaline structure? Hmm? What does that look like? Okay. Have you had anatomy? Yeah. What when you looked at that on a slide, how did you know? Say, so, yeah, you had a hyaline cart cartilage. How did you know it was hyaline cartilage versus some other type of cartilage? Oh, yeah, because some of them were stained. Some of them were stained. So hyaline structure, the reason it, 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 that got its name, the hyaline cartilage, was it's clear. It was when you looked at it, that's, you had the stains to see more of the structures. So it's more of a clear type of cyst. It's a cyst. It's enough to say, hey, the cysticanth is usually insisted inside the host, and that is a parasite-derived cyst. It's not a host-derived cyst. All right. So those are our generalized life cycles. And then you get to, you get to the adult, uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to we're not going to be going over uh, life cycles today, but we're going to talk about a couple of different life cycles of the canthocephalans. The cool thing about a canthocephalans is we have a lot of a lot of examples of host manipulation, host behavior manip manipulation by these parasites. And it's all aimed at increasing the chances that they're going to be consumed by the next host. So we've got a couple of species to go through. Uh, we don't really have any of these in, in the lab, but more than likely we have some species of canthocephalans that utilize same types of intermediate hosts. So we have some of these in our area that utilize the same type of invert hosts, and I wouldn't be surprised if we would see some of the same behavioral modifications. So that's going to be the focus. Not so much like our path, you know, acanth or acanthella, cysticanth, and so forth, but the adaptations to increase transmission success. So we're going to pick this up on Wednesday. We're going to do our, our I think, two life cycles is what I have. Um, talk about behavior manipulation, and then we'll move right to the protozoan parasites. And... I forgot to do this at the start. Parasites in the news. This was, I don't know, at least a week ago, probably two weeks ago. 
CRISPR gene editing technology is being used to develop a vaccine against leishmania. Uh, we're going to talk about leishmania. It's a flagellate. It's going to be one of the first ones we talk about. Probably next week is when we get to uh, leishmania. Uh, disfiguring. You go to Central South America, you can encounter this. So I uh, thought it was pretty cool that, w that we're moving, moving in this direction. Historically, vaccines against protozoan parasites have been pretty big failures, even the plasmodium one. So, pretty cool. That was parasites in the news. All right. Uh, the lab will close around 12.30 or so. 12.30, 12.45. I'm going to go grab some lunch, and then when I get back, the lab will close. So it'll definitely be closed by 1, because I have to get it set up. If you're going down there now to review and you pull a scope out to your bench, just leave that scope at your, at your bench. 